Hey, hello everyone. So this evening we're going to review the timeline. Um, we're going to talk about the um, Easter 3 grant funding, which is about $2.3 million. So I'm going to just do a little reminder. Um, in the fall, um, we came to you and we started the process with, with some of the other um, COVID uh, federal funding. Um, so our total funding was about $4.3 million. Um, we worked with the committee. Uh, so we had a separate committee um, of stakeholders um, that looked at um, that funding at that time. Um, and we presented those, uh, that plan and then had that approved in November. Um, so we brought that committee back together um, and we're going to kind of walk through the process we used for the remainder of the money. So we'll discuss the amount that was committed previously to those um, programs that we discussed in the fall and then we'll review our overall proposal for the rest of the funding. Um, we'll talk about where we are uh, progress in certain areas um, and then provide opportunities for feedback on the funding proposal with the idea that um, we would like to get approval um, at the board meeting next week. So our timeline, we met with our ESER committee um, at, at the end of January, um, so January 31st, and went through um, this program. Um, we have this meeting this evening. Um, next week is the board meeting when we um, will get board approval. Um, we would then submit the grant the next day. It is due on March 1st, and we just found out about that um, about a week and a half, two weeks ago, but we thought that was coming. Um, so they wait till the last minute to tell us when things are due. Um, but our, our goal is to make sure we have it submitted by March 1st. So luckily our timeline worked for that. Oops. Okay, so the funding that was committed, um, so as I said, we talked about um, a lot of programs in the fall um, and we made the plan for um, the other ESER or, or COVID money, federal funding. Um, so I'm sorry, I'm using acronyms, but when we talk about that, that's really the federal funding associated with this. Um, and when we went through those programs, uh, that funding um, funded part of these programs. This remaining piece, 757,000 approximately, uh, is continued funding of those, those programs that we talked about in the fall. So for instance, um, we had the summer school program. Um, there is an additional $258,000 for that. Um, as it shows in your summary that um, we, we attached to board docs, um, that is the program for, for students that need credit recovery, um, students that need an extended school year. Um, so it's really to help with learning loss um, for those students. So you'll see in the last column we have learning loss. Um, so these other programs are all designed for learning loss, but we have to use um, a specific amount of this funding, a minimum amount for learning loss. And so we picked those programs that definitely met every piece of it to put the yes there. But we believe all of these programs actually um, help with learning loss. Um, so I, hopefully that makes sense. But we just wanted to make sure to identify those ones that definitely no ands, ifs, or buts hit that um, learning loss button because we have a certain amount we have to spend on that. The second piece is the staffing plan. So we did the budget last year um, for this school year. Uh, if you remember, we had three um, uh, teaching positions and an aid position um, that we were using federal funding for. Because this was such a large amount of money, we decided to use part of it with a phasing plan, 100% in year one. So this is year one that we're in right now. Next year is year two, 75%. Um, the third year, 50%. So that's what this staffing plan is. Um, Digital Academy, again, that's resources for Digital Academy for Edgenuity and Lincoln Learning. Um, the Check and Connect program, we had to do set-asides. Um, so the first part of that is from the set-asides that we approved in the fall. This is the, the remaining piece of that. Um, the after-school program is the program at the middle school. Again, we had to do set-asides. This is the remaining um, need of funding for that program. And then the final um, piece here is filters, masks, hand sanitizer. Again, we, we paid for a lot of that other, out of other pieces of the grant, and this is the remaining piece. So that's the funding that's committed. And then the other piece I want to bring up, and we are still getting more information. This, this kind of falls under, we just found out about it last week. Um, there are now maintenance of equity requirements. Um, so as you know, we hear folks saying um, you know, different uses for the funds, one thing that we have to make sure of is we meet all requirements. And so um, there are different exceptions. We do not meet most of the exceptions because they're small school exceptions or you only have um, you know, one, for each grade span, you only have one school, which we don't because we have three elementary schools. Um, so um, we do meet the, um, 
the requirement listed here on maintaining per student equity. But I want to, I just want to make sure everyone understands um, it, is, it is relatively difficult to meet these. It's not a slam dunk um, because like for instance, we went up 39 students from last year to this year. Um, and so, you know, by going up more students, it's not, it's not as simple as you think to meet maintenance of equity. So we're going to keep an eye on that. But as we're looking at the proposal for the plan, we have to be very careful that we can't supplant and what that means is we have to make sure our state and um, local uh, funding per student remains above that of um, the, the prior year. You have to continue to maintain the equity. Um, so I know that's complicated and we're, it, every day we're getting more information on that and they're kind of changing the rules, but um, I just wanted to point that out. It's not as simple as we just backfill something. Um, we have to make sure that we're doing something additional with most of the funds. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Bryson to talk about overall goals. So really we had four overall goals. Um, as you can see there, utilize the funding to impact all students and staff. Uh, we believe when you're taking a look at learning loss, um, we can look at every child in the district has, you know, could, could the argument could be made that there's some level of learning loss due to hybrid schedules or you know cyber school and then coming back or be it um, being in digital academy whatever the case may be um, what we wanted to do is put program in place that kind of impacted all students the second piece provide consistent programming k-12 um, both of these in addition to the next two we really wanted to look at Having a consistent program K-12 that we know at the end of this three-year cycle and moving into the future, the district is better off than what it was pre-pandemic uh, for students instructionally and for students social-emotionally uh, and also career awareness and readiness. So really, we didn't want to be short-sighted and say we're just going to spend it and address learning loss and at the end of it, we hope to be back to where we were three years ago. Really, the goal is to be better three years from now than we were three years ago. So the third bullet, continue to address mental health, social, emotional needs, which we have spoke to many, many times um, in regards to concerns in that area. And then lastly, be physically, res physically responsible with whatever we end up um, utilizing the funding for. The categories really that these fit into are academic, social, emotional, mental health, technology, and mitigation. Mitigation being the area that uh, Mrs. Green just spoke to with masking, filters, those types of things. So we created for our third ESERS funding um, a multitude of categories. I'm going to speak to some. Um, Dr. Hughes is going to speak to some. Mrs. Green will speak to some. Um, the first one there, in fact, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Kim. I'm going to speak to the first one, and I'm going to have uh, Kim do the next couple, uh, all related to learning loss and academic needs. The first one there is professional development to systematically address learning loss K-12. Um, so that, a fun that funding amount is not uh, towards one vendor or one uh, individual that's going to do staff development. We know over the next two years we're going to be doing staff development um, to address how to implement high-level research-based pedagogy and teacher instruction to best meet the needs of our students. Um, and while we don't have it defined as to who that will be or who's going to support that, uh, we would come back to you in the future when whatever organization um, we do utilize is, is selected, if we do utilize an outside organization so that we're debriefing you and you, you know who they are and what they're actually doing. The bottom line here is really this. We know the single most important factor for a child in learning is the person that's instructing them. And so the more we develop our staff, the better we are. And again, this really impacts long term, that we're better three years from now than we are now. $262,000 looks, sounds like a lot of money. It is a lot of money. That being said, it comes out to be roughly $1,200 per individual. If that was divvied equally, which isn't really the way it works, but if it was divvied equally amongst professional staff, um, that's the type of education. So 
in retrospect or in, in looking forward, that's far less than a college course. So in essence, we're, we're doing um, we're doing a huge service by doing staff development in the district and doing it in a fiscally responsible way. Part of that is also a lot of which may have to occur over summer, which means you get into the payment and, and having to have your staff in over summertime because we, we don't have the availability of substitutes to pull, to pull teachers. So, Kim? Yep. So the reading program um, and professional development what we've identified is that we, um, several years ago, really started looking at um, what we're doing with balanced literacy and the science of reading. And I identified that we need to look at a systematic approach to be able to support teachers. As we're moving in grades three through eighth grade, um, we feel very confident that the materials that we have in kindergarten through second grade, we have the resources we need we need continued professional development there on the science of reading and helping our teachers understand those components. What we've identified is grades three through eight, we'd like to um, look at additional resources to be able to help teachers as they are implementing the reading program. So we've been doing a lot of research on creating a literacy plan that really looks at incorporating all of those aspects and providing the professional development to our teacher and the resource. So the reading program, um, it will, we are looking at research-based programs that we can bring to you for approval um, for grades three through eighth grade that will allow our teachers to take the next steps and continue to move forward in their understanding and knowledge. And also making sure that we have the correct pieces in every grade level. So looking at a systematic approach of, are we deploying the correct literary elements in each grade level? Does every teacher have the background and the understanding that they need for each of those to make sure that our kids are continually developing and moving forward? And also providing professional de development for our support staff as we go forward. So then that moves into um, intervention supports and a universal screener. What we know is that that tier one program, which is the reading program, we also know that there's a tier two, tier three. And what that means is that there's a certain group of students that need additional support. So tier two and tier three give more specific, like this is the need of this group of children. So we're looking at those intervention programs for tier two and tier three and helping our teachers to be able to look at the data, identify the need, and then have the resources that really fill in those gaps. At the last board meeting, you um, approved one of the programs the spell read that we're looking, but we're looking at more resources and more um, screeners to help us really identify those needs mm -hmm. and looking at that for K through 12. Then we move into STEM materials. This is one that's close to my heart. <laughs> um, we are really looking right now. We know that next gen science standards are incorporated into the new PDE standards that are going um, to legislation to be approved. So we are starting to look right now and say, where are we? So I've done an alignment to say, here's what we currently have, this is what we've been using, and it doesn't align with where the new standards are going. So we're really looking at two things here. <coughs> Making sure that we are implementing those science standards and getting the resources that we need for our teachers. But also pulling in STEM and making sure that we have, um, as they were talking about with the chapter 339, we're preparing students for jobs of the future. So looking at our STEM program, we have been doing research on Project Lead the Way, which really looks at engineering and gives a very solid foundation with um, hands-on real world activities. Um, we've talked to a couple of different districts and um, schools that use this. And it was very interesting. One of the things that the teacher talked to me about is that they had the kids build an apartment complex and they had the code and elevator the stop at every floor. So we were talking about these pieces and saying, our students need to have opportunities that engage in these types of activities. So we're looking right now at Project Lead the Way at our middle school and our high school and eventually adding some pieces in at our elementary. 
to make sure that all of our kids are getting those real world hands on opportunities. So that's a very exciting one that we really want to make sure that we're building our STEM programs here and really um, fostering that the next gen science standards and our PDE standards that really incorporate the learning aspect with the application. So. Okay, go to the next one. Um, the social services coordinator, kind of self explanatory. For those of you who know Jill Platt, she's our current social services coordinator. This would be 2.0, meaning her role in the district has become um, so great and overwhelming um, that we probably, as mentioned by our administrative team, need four or five. Um, but we're going to start with two. Uh, and this topic came up uh, specifically at our, um, at our committee meeting and the need from uh, parents and teachers that all spoke to the need of, of having additional services there so that we're better able to serve those um, that are in need. Um, and if you, if you don't know, Jill um, does a variety of things for us, mainly really tries to tie community resources to the families that are in need. Um, but she also does foster care. She also does homeless liaison. She also does all of our mandated reporting for those two roles. She does attendance um, and really organizes um, the giving that goes around throughout the district for a welfare fund and all things where families, again, are in need of, of basic services at home, health and, and um, nutritional needs, et cetera. So um, Jill is thrilled that we're putting this out there um, and, and hopefully it'll, it'll make a great impact for, for maybe some of our neediest families that we, we do have and see. <laughs> I could take the next one real quick if you want to. Uh, next one's webcams and microphones. Not a big expense for synchronous learning. So for our digital academy, much of our digital academy at this point has moved towards a synchronous learning where students are at home and here, um, but participating within the classroom. The updated webcams and microphones just make that learning a little better of an experience for both the teacher and the students that are at home. And then I'll turn it over. Okay, so this next one, um, cleaning equipment and supplies. So one of the things um, this fall, um, we're getting, getting as creative as we can um, as we continue to have staffing issues um, or you know, not having enough staff in different places. So we were able to um, find some, some cleaning um, equipment, um, long handle cleaners that we can clean the cafeteria tables with. Um, you know, part of Whitson's contract is that they clean the cafeteria tables between um, services. They do not have enough people, so everyone, it's all hands on deck um, to get that done. Um, so we were able to find these um, additional um, long-handled um, cleaning equipment for that. Um, while doing that, um, Mr. Buffington also was able to find some um, micro scrubbers, um, which we don't have any yet, but um, what they do is they are able to clean in small areas like bathrooms and around sinks um, and um, do a really good job with less uh, manpower. They're still operated by people, but it, it's quicker and um, does a really good job. Um, we're also looking in this line item to, to pick up some um, additional auto scrubbers. Um, the, the board has been generous over the last couple of years. We've been able to replace a couple, but we still have some, some pretty old ones. Plus, we'd like to get, um, for our bigger buildings, we'd like to get additional auto scrubbers. Um, high school only has one like the other buildings, and of course, it's, it's much, much bigger. Um, so, you know, again, the idea behind this is to keep our buildings as clean as possible, um, but also to help our staff um, because we, are, we continue to be shorthanded in this area. And then the, the final one, I'm going to turn over to Mr. Hunt and Mr. Carrington, um, who have brought a wonderful proposal to us on how we're going to continue to be one-to-one. Um, -one. So they're going to start back on the journey of, of what happened at the beginning of the pandemic and, and where we were with Chromebooks. Thank you. All right, so we're going to go through our Chromebook purchase plan. <coughs> And as Sue mentioned, this is going to go way back. Um, so I'm just going to start off with how we got here, how we are where we are. Um, so in 2015-16, our high school students formally got Chromebooks. And then before I go too far, I just want to say if Greg or I use the word device or computer or machine, we refer to Chromebooks. Um, it's just a lot easier to, to use some different words. 
So in 2015-16, our high school students had Chromebooks for the first time, and they were one-to-one. -one. So that means every student had one, and every student took one home. The next year, our middle school went one-to-one. -one. So same deal, every student had one, and they took them home. Um, elementary students began using new Chromebooks in 2019-20. So uh, that actually started in 2018-19, and then 2019-20, we had Chromebooks for our elementary students, and they were not one-to-one. -one. So they weren't intended to go home, um, and not every student had a device. So grades four through six, they all had their own device. Uh, grades second and third, they were two-to-one, so there was some sharing going on, and then K through one, they were three-to-one, so less use, um, less devices. And then we get to March of 2020. So uh, as we all know, schools, we, we went virtual. Um, we were then forced one-to-one -one through the distribution of our unsold Chromebooks. So to rewind a little bit, how did we get all these unsold Chromebooks? So our 2015-16, that was a lease. We were given the opportunity to buy these devices for a very good price. Actually ended up being about $18 a device for $950. So for about $17,000, we had 950 Chromebooks. Um, our original plan was to sell those Chromebooks pretty quickly because we knew there was a, a, a benefit to that. Um, and some reasons why we didn't sell them, uh, Greg and his team had to distribute all the no, new Chromebooks we got. So not only did we get a new Chromebook lease in 2019-20 for the high school, we had it for all of these elementary school students. So we had tons of Chromebooks out there, and our retired Chromebooks were sitting waiting to be sold. And then what Greg's team did is they looked and discovered how many we could use as loaners, how many we could fix other Chromebooks with. And then throughout that entire year, we were working with vendors um, trying to get the best pricing to buy those Chromebooks from us. Then we come into March of 2020, and we realized we could really use 950 Chromebooks. So we fortunately were able to very quickly shift to being a one-to-one -one school district. So we got really lucky. We <laughs> incredibly lucky. Other schools were driving to every Best Buy they could find to get iPads and other devices. We actually had them. So we were very fortunate. Um, so now, currently, what are we doing? Um, all students in all grade levels have a Chromebook. The high school is in the third year of that Chromebook's life. The middle school is in the second year of those Chromebooks. And then elementary, they're either in their second or third year. And that's because we bought some and we leased some. And they're pretty much the same age. So as of right now, the way we have our plan, Chromebooks stay within each building. So if you're a ninth grader, you always have a Chromebook that is meant for the high school. If you're an elementary school student, it's always meant for an elementary school. Those Chromebooks cycle between the grades as needed. So if you're a senior, your Chromebook goes back to a freshman the next year. Um, and then what we did in the past, we leased our Chromebooks. So there's some pros and cons to leasing versus buying. The biggest part about buying up front is that you do pay more, but you save the leasing costs. So the big part of that is interest. And I'm going to turn it over to Greg. All right, so as Trevor said, where we were before, we were buying the Chromebooks at a building by building level, um, buying it for the whole high school, the whole middle school, the elementary schools were kind of chunked into two different sections. Uh, when we went one to one, this quickly became not sustainable to be able to do it that way. There were gonna be really big highs, really big or really low lows for buying Chromebooks and it just wasn't gonna work out for the budget or for summer maintenance. So we started looking at different opportunities and we came across a different model that a few other school districts have been using for a couple of years and it's worked really well for them. They actually call it the injection method where they inject Chromebooks at grade level one, five, and nine. Those students then keep that same device for four years. That way it keeps within the warranty period for the entire four years. And they said that the biggest difference that they've seen was the students take greater responsibility for the device because it's theirs if they want it to work great in year four they need to take care of it. Um, as opposed to a ninth grader coming in on the fourth year of the lease, knowing they're only gonna have the Chromebook for one year, and they may you know, be a little bit rougher with it than if it was theirs, even though it's still the district's. Um, kindergarten is not on the list, 
they will get the best of the best for fifth year Chromebooks. Um, I'll touch on this in a little bit, but it's basically we're trying to stick close to the enrollment numbers and it is a little bit different between first and kindergarten. Um, the remaining Chromebooks beyond what we give back to kindergarten uh, will be used as loaners. Anything that's broken will be using it as parts or anything that's in excess of that, they'll be resold on the market. Um, right now, Chromebooks do fetch a, a pretty good price on the resale market just because they're, they're needed everywhere. Um, 23-24 is our planned phase-in year with 26-27 being the first year to be completely in place. Uh, just a quick breakdown of the pricing of the Chromebook. We are currently averaging about $400 per Chromebook per student. Um, $275, maybe edging up on $300 for the actual Chromebook cost. We need the Chrome management license, which sticks with that one Chromebook for the duration of its life. Uh, that way we can manage everything centrally, be able to push out applications, do everything we need to do behind the scenes. Um, like I said, the four-year bumper-to-bumper warranty, uh, $65 is about average of what we've been seeing, and $25 for a case uh, that dramatically helps the, the breakage rates. And another, this kind of goes back to the, the injection method of if we buy like we've been currently buying, where we buy for, let's say, the whole middle school, we have to forecast out four years to see where the highest class levels are. If this is a perfect example, in 15-16 at the middle school, we had 466 students. In 17-18, we had 519. If we were going with the old model that we have or we're currently doing, we have to buy for that 519 up front. That leaves 53 devices sitting on the shelf for two years waiting for that 519 to come in. And when you factor out that money, that's $20,000 that's sitting on the shelf for two years waiting for a class to come in. If we do it this way, where we're doing the first grade, fifth grade, and ninth grade, we're buying for the enrollment of that grade level or of that class size. And as the class sizes go through the, the buildings, they don't really change. So we can pretty much buy exactly what we need just a little bit extra for breakages or damages and keep moving. Whereas now there could be a dramatic variation and we'd rather have the, the brand new Chromebooks in the hands of the students rather than sitting on the shelf. All right, so why move to this plan? Find the right paper. Yeah, so as I said, it will help the students develop a sense of responsibility for it being their Chromebook. Um, we can also take advantage of new technologies as they come out. Um, we've been seeing Chromebooks take leaps and bounds in technology or technological advances over the past couple of years. When they first came out, Google, I think, was kind of doing like a, a trial run just to see if it would work. They weren't putting too much um, durability into them. The lifespan of them was only maybe four to six years. Uh, recently, Google has actually extended the lifespan of them up to about uh, eight years now. So we'll be able to have them for longer. They, they are much more durable. The touch screens, the, the, the glass that's made out of them, it's just a lot of things that every year we can take advantage of uh, new and, newer and newer technologies. Um, it also provides for a more reliable uh, loaner, st loaner stack that we have where after they, the students turn them in in grades you know, four, eight, and uh, 12, we can take the best of the best, give them to the <coughs> kindergarten, take the next best of the best, and constantly replace them as our loaner stash. So every year we're going to have year five Chromebooks. That'll be good. They'll be able to go out to the buildings. We'll have plenty of them. That way, you know, we're, our goal is to make sure that students maintain a Chromebook in their hands at all times for the entire school year. Um, I've already touched on that we can stick closer to the enrollment numbers when purchasing, it, purchasing this way, um, and then sell the remaining and it also helps us stabilize the Chromebook budget. Like I said, buying for the buildings, we were kind of going up and down and it wasn't staying sta uh, stable. Doing it this way, we can buy for three grade levels. They're, it may vary a little bit, but not anywhere near what it is right now. So this is a very colorful mess of a chart, but it kind of gives a good timeline of what, what we're proposing. On the left-hand side is our model now where we're buying in chunks for each building. And the right is where we're going to inject it at grades one, grades five, and grades nine. That way, you know, we'll have a nice rolling cycle as we go. 
23-24 through 25-26 is our transition years. 23-24 um, will be the largest influx and that's where we're proposing the ESER money to be able to get us rolling on this plan and get uh, the devices cycled before they get too far into their uh, lifespan. Um, the few things that we do understand with this is that grades 12, 8, and 4 will always have four-year-old devices. The good thing about that is that, like I said, Google has made their lifespan a lot longer. So year four in the older day, or like the old Chromebooks that we had, that was the end of the life cycle of the Chromebook. The newer Chromebooks, that's about halfway if they're rating them up to about eight years. In theory, we could probably get about six years out of them, six, seven years, because students are a little bit, I wouldn't say rougher, but it's just you know, back and forth and everything. They, they do get beat up a little bit more than if it was just sitting at somebody's house. Um, and then grade five, or kindergarten will always have the, the year five Chromebook, but we are very confident that we'll have the extra devices, we'll have everything on hand that we can make sure that they're, they're ready to roll. Um, this also helps to eliminate some of the maintenance. Year, or middle school seven, eight, they'll always have year three and year four Chromebooks. Not only will they be very sufficient in working, but we'll also cut down on the collection and distribution. The middle school right now, they have staff, they have volunteers, we help out to do the collection and distribution every year and recycle them. By doing it this way and having the student hold it from grades five up through grade nine, the middle school will never have to do a collection or distribution again. So that really puts time back into the buildings, it puts time back into our schedule so that we can go back out and work or do work orders, do other projects. Um, it kind of goes hand in hand to be able to help out all the way around. And I'll turn it back over to Trevor now that we're back on Monday. <laughs> yep. So I had a pretty number light presentation until this point. Um, so the top of this, and really this is just the cost breakdown, and I'm not going to get too into the specifics because there are a lot of really little numbers up there. However, um, the, top, the top two lines, so it just shows each year, and then it shows our student class size. So that would be the total number of Chromebooks we're purchasing for. So that first year is our big inflection year, so it's not going to be that 159, it's a few grade levels. But then every year after, so 24, 25, all the way through 29, 30, you see it's about 591 all the way to 624. So what that is, it's allowing us to really look at our expected class size. In the past, when we put this plan together, we'd say, okay, well, it's about 250 a grade level, so we'll probably need 750 Chromebooks, and then we have to put it up a little bit based on enrollment and things like that. So really what this top part is showing is that we're able to get a much more accurate number because we do know what our class sizes are. So then when you look at the second group of numbers, it's our lease payments. This is just showing we're no longer going to be leasing, we're going to be buying everything up front. So the purchase price in that first year is 621,000. And again, this is a round estimated number because we really don't know our actual enrollment yet. We don't know Chromebook cost them, um, but just for purposes of the presentation. And then after that big first in, um, infusion of Chromebook devices, we then have a number about $250,000 every year after that. And that's because we know our class size and it's, we're only buying three grade levels at a time. And then the next line you see our current Chromebook budget, it's about $230,000 uh, in 23, 24, and then in 24, 25. And then the line under that is the additional funding we would need for this plan. So the big one is that first year of uh, $392,000. That is what's in our Easter plan. That every year after that, it's a pretty small number. So it's $13,000, uh, it's $17,000 the next year. And then after that, we actually give money back into the plan um, because based on our current projections, this kind of sustains itself. Um, and then the last part, and again, this is just an estimate. So. It's the estimated amount of Chromebooks removed from circulation. So that first year is our big removal. We're taking 1,750 devices out of the hands of our students because they're getting the new devices. So with those 1,700 Chromebooks, we'll be given the option to either resell them uh, to one of the vendors that we were trying to sell our Chromebooks to initially. Um, and we used an estimated uh, price per device of $25. 
So say we were able to, so all of our devices, we'd get $25,000. That, what we would do is actually look at it and say, okay, these are the numbers we need for, for loaners, here's what we're gonna take for repairs, and then we're going to sell this bulk amount of the rest. That's really just given, um, so you kind of can understand what we're doing there. Uh, and then every year after, we'd say, say if we sold everything, this is what we'd get for it. Um, so really, if, if we were to retire our Chromebooks and then sell them to one of the vendors, that excess amount funding needed for this plan is almost zero, or we could actually not turn a profit, but very much break even by doing this. Can I ask a question? Is there an estimated cost for maintenance, you know, if they drop it or something happens? I know there's an option for families to buy insurance. It could be covered that way, but is that incorporated into something? It is. So a couple of slides back was when we had the, the cost breakdown. So part of that is included in the warranty. Greg would have better specifics on the specifics, but that does normally covers the... Yeah, the warranty covers everything, bumper to bumper on the Chromebook. Okay. Um, the, if it's an accidental breakage, it's covered. If it's a manufacturer defect, it's, it's covered. Okay. The only thing that's not covered is if it's an intentional damage. So if a student were to hit it with a hammer or intentionally run over it with a car or something, Hope not. that's not covered. But every, everything else is covered for the full, full four years. He's not making a uh, well, well, surprise. Specific <laughs> examples. <laughs> Once it's out of warranty after that fourth year, that's one of the, the, the great things about this because let's say it takes a hundred dollar part and it's in year five, there's no there's no reason for us to fix it at that point because it's in year five and it's a hundred dollars and it's just not so that was part of as we were going through things, looking at um, you know, when you're getting in those later years, um, using those as learners versus um, returning and all those kinds of things. So, because so, originally when we did the plan years ago, it was a six, we used the six year, we were gonna keep them in circulation for six years, and, but so now we said that doesn't really make sense because if we have to fix all of them, it's just cost prohibitive. But if we can use them for learners, if they break, we're just, and it's expensive, we just won't keep it anymore. How does that work in fixing them? Is there a staff that fixes these? Yes. Yeah, we have uh, technicians down in the tech department that fix them. Um, is it right? a oh, is sorry, it, is it, I'm sorry, is it a tough timeline? Uh, it has been, just because the, the pandemic and the worldwide shortage with parts and everything, it has been, the supply chain of getting stuff in has been really, really long lead times. So there are um, a lot of loaners now, I guess, you know, if it's a yeah, long we, timeline to fix, there's, there's enough loaners now it's, to cover? It's very tight right now. Oh um, this, this plan would allow us to have more learners in the buildings. That way we don't have to get to a point that it's tight again. Yeah. Um, luckily, parts are starting to come back in the stock. We're starting to, we had been having lead times of six, seven months. Now we're running a couple weeks. I think the longest time that we've had to wait recently was about five weeks for some parts to come in. Um, yeah, so it, it was pretty tough there for a while. We're, we're still we're part of their backlog of repairs now that we're actually getting things in, but we still have some loaners out. And hopefully we can even it out soon. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And it is labor intensive, so just want to give a shout out. How many, how many devices do we have, <coughs> Greg, District 1? Including staff or just yeah. staff? With staff, run about 4,000. So we have 4,000 for staff, so again, it's, it's, it's a big undertaking. Mm -hmm. And Greg, can you just share um, the, your fine folks in the department because it's a fairly small department overseeing <laughs> all of that. Can I do what? Can you share the number of folks or the individuals, just their names in your department too because you've got a small team yeah. Yeah, doing so, a lot of work. Yes, yeah, so we don't, there's only six of us in the department. It's myself, Heather is our data system specialist, um, Dan Jager, he's actually running the TV studio right now behind the lines. Um, Kat, who's normally here in place of Heather, um, she's our help desk, and then we just have two technicians, uh, Woody and Brian, that are the ones who do a, a bulk of the repair. Do we still have the tech shed with the students? Yes. 
Yeah, they actually have been doing a tremendous job in helping out with the middle, high school, and the, the elementary school. We have them running around picking stuff up or going to classrooms, fixing projectors, helping teachers with problems. They've, they've been a tremendous asset. Okay. And Jack's going to say, we have our, yeah. our student um, right now. Yeah, we, we have a, a student from the tech shed who just started in technology uh, like four or five hours a day. So he comes down and he's just dedicated to repairing the Chromebooks to help us catch up on the backlog. Oh, that's wonderful. Does this include teacher Chromebooks or like this? Plan so this plan is just um, focused students. on student Chromebooks. Okay. The one positive <coughs> that we have from this plan, we would be able to loan out to anybody that needs them. Um, teacher Chromebooks are a little bit easier in that we did buy a one-time purchase. They are brand new. I think we got them a couple months ago. So we have some time on that, and it's not a, we wouldn't have to kind of roll them out in the same way. And they don't go home every day and things like that. As much. They're more, I don't want to say more responsible. Well, um, true. Yeah, class. true. They're going to back and not falling. Um, yeah. They rarely get accidentally run over by cars. Really? So, <laughs> <laughs> the hammer, not so much. <laughs> all right, and that's all we have. So I have a question, I think it's for you. I know typically um, for one-time funding, we don't put a recurring cost in there. So the question is about the social services coordinator. That's an annual cost. Is that in the budget? Did we approve that yet or is it in the upcoming budget? That is not, that would be in um, Easter funding. That, that is in federal funding and we actually talked extensively about that one because of it be re being reoccurring. Um, we, as a committee uh, internally and the committee, the Easter committee, um, felt so strongly that that is a position um, that is needed that um, if, if it, once this funding's over, even if we would not have funding in the general fund budget, we, we'd have to make it work. We would have to either remove another position or, uh, but we, we think um, that strongly that we need a second uh, social worker. So okay. we've talked about it. I think the other piece that's playing into this too, um, one of the roles uh, Jill plays for being social services is to tie parents, students to county agencies that are able to help provide the services. Here's the problem. They don't have the human resources within these agencies right now to provide the services. So while we can recommend and we can, you know, send them to see the right people, if they can't provide the services, we're, we're still sitting here hoping that the child has a better situation tomorrow um, than they did today and be able to focus on school more. And it's just not happening. So um, part of I mean, part of what it's coming to is if we're going to get the person help, we're looking at what can we do right here internally um, to be able to do that. So, But it's at a cost. And the, the, our, I mean, the administrative team is fully behind this and understands what that means two years from now is either we pick it up in the general fund or another position doesn't get filled. Whatever the case may be, we've got to, we're going to have to take on that salary moving forward. It's a good question. Yeah. Other questions? Can I build on that question? Of course. So, so when I'm looking at this, I'm thinking that, you know, what we approve that there are going to be connections to things that we have to continue to fund, like what we just talked about, right? So if I heard everything correctly, when I look at this list, right, and I go line by line and I say, well, what still needs to be funded after the funding is gone, right? So the staffing plan where we have the three teachers and the aides, that would continue to be funded, right, because that's not currently in our budget, this is funding. Yes, so but yeah, but let me, let me add a piece please. to that. Uh -huh. um, so when we put that in place, so 
the idea is that it's 100 percent out of federal funding in this year mm -hmm. next year it'll be 75 the third year it'll be 50 so we would have to put 50 percent back into our budget but so we would have to put the whole whole amount back into the budget we'd have to put a partial amount back into to the general fund budget right and then by year four it would be have to be fully funded mm -hmm. so the 226 number what is that so the is 226, the so what gets a little confusing, I have I think my charts over there, but what gets confusing with this is because there's different pieces of money, that's what was not in the other federal grants. So when you add it all, we have a chart that adds all of these together. We can attach that to show you. It would be staffing plan, and then it would have the different, um, so there's the CARES Act, there's ESER 1, ESER 2, ESER 3, and the mm -hmm. set-asides. Mm -hmm. Um, so we put part of it out of different buckets, and this is what's remaining of that staffing plan, that 100%, 75%, 50%. Okay. And so then on year four, then what would that number look like? Because it, it, cause like you said, it's in a couple different budgets now. I don't know. Is that a fair question to ask? I'm yeah. just trying to yeah, think about it. Yeah, so it would, it would probably, and this is off the top of my head, yeah, so yeah, I yeah. can get you yeah, exact, yeah. but if it's three professional staff and an aide and... We have 50% in the general fund and 50% in federal on year three. In year four, it will probably be an, about 200,000. The name becomes four because of the psychologist. So the first year it was, um, so just to clarify, that one is three professional staff in year one. Mm -hmm. uh, so the year we're sitting in is year one. Mm -hmm. um, three professional staff, one support. Year two is three professional staff, one support staff, and our psychologist. Who is grant? Uh, so we are yeah, getting all it's getting more lots confusing. of stuff, but we have a grant that we got um, right at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, <coughs> we have a psychologist, and that's funded for two years. So next year, this grant is picking up that year, the, his salary for that year at seventy-five percent, and then the next year would be those four positions plus the support staff position, and it is, I think, around. I'm gonna guess two hundred. $50,000. Yeah, so let us, yeah, let us not guess. It's got, it's probably in the two, two fifty, but okay. let us actually okay. figure out what that number is. Okay. So, so staffing plan, that would get carried forward. That's going to be something that we need to sustain. Mm -hmm. The check and connect secondary, is that something that we need to continue, or is that like a program fee that we pay for and then it's done? Yeah, so, well, it's not anything you, it's, it is services are provided. So, we pay for the services. Okay. Um, and we can opt beyond year two to not do it. Okay. Yeah, I think the originals are three, or three, three yeah. year, and then and then we'd have to decide whether or not we were going to continue to do it. Okay. And then we talked about the social services coordinator that would need to be funded. Um, and then with the beautiful presentation that you did on the Chromebook, so the 400000 would come out and then like the extra, and that's like the big chunk that we would need. But then every year thereafter, like you're looking at 13000 17000 Okay. So what we're trying to do is actually smooth it out yeah. for budget purposes. So did I retain that correctly, that those would be the only items that would be moving forward into budgets past the grant funding? Yes, uh, the exception to that, I would say, is mm -hmm. some of the um, intervention pieces. If we, if we found things that we think were great for kids um, and we wanted to continue, and there right. may be some of those type of things that so, we need to do. Yeah. Um, interventions, we have tried. Oh, sorry. Otherwise, we're not going to record right. um, Interventions, we've tried to pick things that are once where we buy the books and have them in so they're programs that are actually in hand mm -hmm. um we tried to stay away from online digital things that would have a reoccurring cost mm -hmm. um the programs that we're looking for for the reading programs <coughs> they come with a six-year license so that's about the lifespan of just like the chromebooks the a reading program has about a seven year six seven year um so we're looking at those aspects the only one that has a reoccurring cost is Project Lead the Way. Mm -hmm. um, that's a $950 cost that we pay um, for each bill, um, each level. So we would pay that per year and then any kind of um, consumables that go with that. Mm -hmm. So we would pick up those, but we're pretty confident that, that those can come out of curriculum and building budgets. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to be very fiscally sound in what we're looking at and making sure that we can you know, sustain this for longevity. Okay. 
And you did get a grant for that, right? Like, yes. That's you. <laughs> yes, so, and we applied, um, we got the middle school grant, and then we applied for one for the high school. So oh, we're okay. waiting here back to see if we got that one or not. That's awesome, thank you. Yeah, and the, the only other one that I noted on here, so the middle school after school club program, oh. again, if, if we, after this grant funding, after the three years is over, if that's something that we felt was great for kids and we wanted to continue, um, it'd be at relatively minimal cost, but it would be something if we want to sustain it, we'd have to okay. and put it in general fund. And just one question, if I could, Susan. I just uh, was reading that um, the federal budget is going to be unveiled tomorrow around 12. So are you anticipating, because there's talk that the educational funding is going to be a lot more than it has um, for that money to come in that we can also anticipate, you know, that offset budget. Federal budget or state budget? It's a state budget. Uh, state budget. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay, so Governor Wood. Okay, yeah, I just want to make sure, because yeah. I, I was like, I was trying to put it Sorry, yes, we'll yes, by the state budget. <laughs> so, so here's what I'm going to tell you about the state budget. Just be very, very careful because, um, so that's Governor Wolf's plan, and I can pretty much guarantee you um, by at least the middle of June, we will not know what is and what is not in there. So, um, you know, one of the things that's difficult for us and extremely difficult for us is, while that is the governor's proposal, um, that does not mean we're getting it and we cannot count on it. Um, and all of us have been doing this for a long time now. I mean, it is not, there's no way it's passed by May May when we have to pass our budget or when we do pass our budget. And definitely, I mean, I'd say in my 20 years, there might have been four, possibly five years that it actually passed by June 30th. Okay. So, um, you know, we have to be careful because that's, that's, I mean, I'm sure it's going to be a great budget, but we can't count on it at that point. That's not, and so what, the way we budget is we budget based upon what we know. Um, and there's only been two years in my 20 that we've gotten money taken away from us. Um, so we usually budget that we're gonna at least be at the place we are now. Um, so yeah, we gotta be a little careful with it. And again, I'm sure Governor Wolf is saying he's gonna put money forth for, for education. That's wonderful, but I don't know that we can, can take it to the bank yet. Yeah. Or how much we will see if we see right. a change. Right. Mm -hmm. Don't we always see very little? I mean, compared to other schools in Pennsylvania. Yeah, we, we generally don't see a lot because a lot of times it's based on your on some of your parameters, your size. Um, again, even though we around here are relatively small, we're actually a relatively larger district um, in the state. And then um, your your free and reduced lunch population, your limited English proficiency. Again, we're, we're on the lower side, so we, we tend to see see lower numbers there. Okay. Other questions? I just had a comment. I know, and you'll have to forgive me because I can't remember. Way back, whether it was on an Esther committee meeting we sat on, or it could have been at a, a school board meeting that we presented, you had a really excellent chart that kind of like showed the funding and how it was coming out of this grant and where this was being funded. And I think this is how it would do, that would really help her out a lot. And it was way in the beginning when we started this. So I don't know if she necessarily had those resources. So she might benefit from, and it might answer some of her questions. Thank you. We actually, Trevor and I were starting even to get confused, so I understand. <laughs> <laughs> so we just put together, and I should say we, Trevor just put together as we talked through um, a really good resource that we look at it by program and grant and total it up to the 4.2 million. And then we look at it by year because that's a whole different, mm -hmm. another piece that you have to throw in. So we can add that to um, the agenda for next week to kind of illustrate a little better where these pots of money are because there's just all between the set asides and the different grants and the different years, it, it does get tricky. Okay. So And you had it beautifully laid out. How you had it, like, there was no questions. It was like, it was all there. Great visual. All right, great. We'll, we'll find that one too. But we, we have a new one that we put together that we'll, we'll attach to. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you. Other questions? Any other questions or clarifications though that anyone might think would be beneficial for the public, either prior to the next meeting or to be included in the next meeting too, just for us to be proactive or anything for tonight? Is, is there anything with the maintenance? I was trying to do a little bit of research on the maintenance of equity. Is there anything with that? Because I know we don't qualify for an exception. So is there anything within that that means that we couldn't get the funding? 
So we actually, qual we don't qualify for the three main exceptions for this year, but we qualify for the fourth exception, which is the um, piece that compares your per student state and local um, funding for this year compared to last year. So I did that calculation and you, they had a couple different ways you could do it. So the one way we did, we were, we were good. Um, so we qualified for that for um, this year, but what they're saying is for next year um, that there won't be that exception and we're still waiting for more um, information on how we have to calculate that. Okay. Um, because one of the interesting pieces is um, you have to look at your um, lowest, um, your highest poverty area, so lowest income uh, schools. Um, and it's difficult for us to figure that out now because no one has to fill out the free and reduced lunch application because everyone's free. Right. Um, so um, we're still waiting for more guidance and it seems like they send the guidance and the next day they change the guidance. So um, that's pretty new and we're, we're keeping an eye on that. Okay. Um, but I, I think we'll be, I do think we'll be fine okay. with it. I think we'll be okay. And that, that goes to another point, Samantha, as we go along. Um, with this, this is our plan, but we will. Ha it's a three-year period, so it's yeah. You know, we'll talk about that quite a bit. I mean, this number's high, this number's low. I mean, we. I can guarantee you, we're going to have to come back and do some revisions as we go along. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Comments? Oh, so go ahead. I'm sorry for comments. I want. Uh, it was a great presentation, but I especially appreciated the Chromebook layout. Mm -hmm. I think it's a great plan, the one, five, nine grades, and just having every detail up there and every dollar, but well, it's great. Thanks. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Absolutely. A excellent presentation. Thank you guys. Um, and I can say, uh, being a part of the ESSER committee with Mr. Bauman, Ms. Stoberman, you guys did a really great job of making sure you were getting all stakeholders' input and allowing everybody to have a piece of that. I mean, I was in a group with a parent, an administrator, um, a teacher, and, and just hearing all those different perspectives and was just really, really awesome. So I appreciate what you did there. So thank you. Big thank you to that committee and everybody. Honestly, the, as was indicated, the state comes out with this. You got three weeks or what, you know, and it's got to be board approved. Well, how do you get stakeholder input? So thank you because we put the email out and say, hey, we're getting back together, getting the game together again. Um, How's next week uh, so that we can get some feedback on on what we're you know what we've talked about and discussed. So thank you to them for being flexible. Absolutely, absolutely. All right, any new business?